So maybe you watched my last video on how to get a better oven spring, but you're still not quite getting the rise on your loaves that you're looking for. Well, today we're gonna talk about five more tips that you can use to get a better oven spring. So let's get into it. If you're new here, my name is Charlie, and on this channel, I show you how to make delicious food using simple ingredients and techniques. So let's talk sourdough. Now, before we get into the tips, I just wanted to let you all know that I've created a free sourdough quick start guide, which walks you through everything you need to know to get started in sourdough baking. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure to click the link in the description below. So let's get into the tips. And tip number one is gonna be gluten development. To create a high rise on your loaves, you need a lot of air bubbles throughout the dough. And in order for those air bubbles to blow up nice and large without popping, you need plenty of gluten development. So if you imagine blowing up a balloon, that's essentially what's happening inside your dough to all those little gas bubbles that inflate during fermentation. So the gluten is basically like the rubber of the balloon that gives the dough its elasticity and allows it to hold in those gases. So aside from the type of flour that you use, the two main factors that help us develop gluten in our dough are time and folding. And it all starts with the autolyse. During that time, the flour becomes hydrated and enzymes start to break down the proteins in the wheat, which begins the gluten development process. So the autolyse is an important step in achieving proper gluten development in your dough, which will ultimately lead to a better oven spring. Then during the bulk fermentation, gluten continues to develop and strengthen, and the sets of fold throughout that period are very important to align the gluten strands and continue to build that structure into your dough. So if your dough doesn't seem to have enough gluten development, you can try performing more sets of folds throughout the bulk fermentation. Also, if you do have the flexibility in your recipe to use different types of flour, you could also try using a higher proportion of white flours as opposed to whole wheat, because it's a lot tougher to develop gluten in a whole wheat flour. Now on a similar note, tip number two is to create extensibility in your dough. The dough's extensibility is how easily and how far it can stretch without resistance. So when you're working with the dough, it's essentially a balancing act between creating a strong dough via gluten development and creating an extensible dough. So if you think about the gas bubbles within the dough in terms of rubber bands, this sturdy one is basically like a dough that's very strong but not very extensible. So it's tough to break, but it's also tough to expand. So the bubbles won't blow up very large in the dough. Now this one is a lot more extensible. So it's still strong enough to hold in the gases in the dough, but it'll blow up much easier, leading to a higher oven spring and more open crumb on your bread. But keep in mind, a dough that's too extensible won't be strong enough to even hold the gases in. So it'll end up spreading flat when you bake it. So again, it's all about creating the right balance between strength and extensibility. With that being said though, how do we actually create a more extensible dough? Well, the easiest way is just to bump up the hydration, but that of course comes with its own issues because it makes the dough harder to handle. And if you use too high of a hydration, it can impair the gluten development of the dough. So it will take a bit of experimentation to figure out exactly what the right hydration is for your particular recipe. And then another way to create a more extensible dough is to either perform a longer auto lease or perform less sets of folds throughout the bulk fermentation. Personally, I like to err on the side of higher hydration and then just perform more sets of folds if I need more gluten development. And then if I still don't have enough gluten development, I'll just bump down the hydration a bit next time I make the recipe. Now tip number three is to handle the dough as gently as possible throughout the shaping process and at the end of bulk fermentation. As we've discussed, there should be a lot of bubbles that have developed throughout the course of fermentation. So in order to keep those bubbles intact, we need to handle the dough very gently. Of course, you do still wanna pop any large bubbles that form on the surface and avoid creating any abnormally large bubbles during shaping so that you still end up with a uniform crumb. But just avoid slamming your dough down on your surface or handling it too roughly in general, because again, that could degas it and wipe out all those bubbles that you've worked so hard to develop. Now tip number four is to proof your dough for the proper amount of time. I discussed this a little bit in my baguette video, but essentially when performing the final proofing, you know the dough is ready to bake when it springs back slowly when poked. During the final proof, the dough inflates with the gases produced during fermentation, but the gluten structure also slowly breaks down. So you wanna bake the dough once it's inflated to its maximum potential, but before it's lost a significant amount of its structure. So at the beginning of the final proof, the dough will spring back right away when poked because the gluten structure is at its strongest. But once it's properly proofed, the gluten structure will have broken down slightly, hence taking longer to spring back. And if the dough doesn't spring back at all, you know that it's overproofed. So just make a note to use a shorter proof next time. Again, this is gonna take a bit of experimentation, so you may need to overproof a few loaves in order to find that perfect sweet spot. 
Finally, tip number five is to retard your dough, meaning to perform the final rise at a low temperature, for example, in your refrigerator, and you wanna bake it in a very hot oven straight after you take it out of the fridge. Working with a cold dough basically does three things. It makes your dough easier to score, allows it to hold its shape better, preventing it from spreading out flat, and it delays the hardening of the crust since your dough will take longer to heat up. So if you've seen my last Oven Spring Tips video, you know about the importance of scoring, and you also realize how crucial the shape of the dough is. But the reason that we want the crust to stay soft longer is because once that crust hardens, the dough can no longer freely expand, and therefore the Oven Spring will be over. So in order to maximize your oven spring, you want the crust to stay soft for as long as possible. And that's essentially the same reason that we incorporate steam during the first few minutes of baking because that also allows the crust to stay soft for a longer period of time. So I hope this video helped you out. And if you wanna learn how to make sourdough baguettes, be sure to click the video in the bottom right corner of the screen. I'll see you all in the next one.